do a little mic check. Can everybody hear that okay? Cool, great. It's good to see you all. Thank you all for being here. We're going to get started here, I guess, right now. Um, welcome, everybody, to not only Pima Community College downtown campus, but to the seventh annual Raquel Rubio Goldsmith Lecture. We cannot tell you how grateful we are for all of you to be here in person. And hi to everybody in the Techverse streaming from YouTube. It's good to have you here as well. So, my name is Marcos Guerrero Trujillo. My pronouns are they, them. I teach sociology and gender and women's studies here at the college and also do the administrative support for the discipline of sociology. I am pleased to welcome you to the seventh annual Raquel Rubio Goldsmith Lecture, and we are so honored to be joined by our keynote, Karen Washington, and we thank her and all of you for being here tonight. Pima Community College and Tucson, Arizona reside on the traditional homelands of the Tohono O'odham and the Pasquayaki people. And while we acknowledge that acknowledgments are important, they are intended as a single step in a larger process of reconciliation between indigenous people and colonial entities. It is from this understanding that I encourage Pima to make meaningful material steps towards reconciliation, which could look like removing tuition and fees for indigenous students, land back, or monetary and material represent reparations to local indigenous communities. This event is one of two annual events that we do in our department here at Pima. Our lecture series is named after Dr. Raquel Rubio Goldsmith. Dr. Goldsmith is one of the founding professors of Pima Community College, which is currently enjoying its 54th year as an institution. Dr. Rubio Goldsmith is not only a visionary in, a, in her collaboration with colleagues to create a local, accessible, and responsive community college here in Tucson, but she has also been a foundational champion in the disciplines of Mexican American studies and ethnic studies at large. Not only has she helped to establish these disciplines in the systems of University of Arizona and Pima Community College, but she has made meaningful contributions and support to the field of ethnic studies, both locally, nationally, and in a global capacity. It is for these reasons that we honor and highlight Dr. Raquel Rubio Goldsmith as the namesake of our lecture. This event is made possible by a team of volunteers, many of which you've seen kind of buzzling around tonight. My co-organizer, Dr. Tiffany Amorete Young and I would like to thank and recognize the EGTSS Event Planning Committee, which includes Dr. Francisca James Hernandez, Elizabeth Gaxiola, Sherry Stewart, Anna Rodriguez, and Yolanda Gonzalez. We would also like to thank the Office of the Provost and Interim Provost Jeff Thies for the budgetary support of this event, in addition to Christy Snowden, a student, student senator, and an administrative assistant that has been instrumental to us being able to accomplish the event planning for tonight. Our gratitude and thanks go out to Dan Pennard of the PCC TV and media team, everyone behind the scenes back there keeping us looking nice, thank you, and to Mike Rahm who's providing our technical assistance. And to you all, we appreciate your time, sharing your energy, sharing your community with us, and we feel really grateful that you feel so welcome here on campus. Next, we will have a short video from Chancellor, um, excuse me, Interim Chancellor Dolores Duran Cerda. Unfortunately, the Chancellor was unable to be here tonight as she is traveling for business, but we really appreciate her willingness to support this event through sending in a video kind of introducing herself and connecting to this event. She's been a longtime supporter of not only our department, but these events. So we'll hear a quick little introduction from the Chancellor. Thank you. Hi, I am Dolores Duran Cerda, Interim Chancellor of Pima Community College. It is my privilege to welcome you to the 2023 Raquel Rubio Goldsmith Lecture. Bienvenidos a todos. The Raquel Rubio Goldsmith Lecture Series began in 2016, and I'm happy to say it is stronger than ever in 2023. Initiated and driven by our faculty, this event has a positive impact on our learners and the community. I'd like to recognize the people who worked hard to make this event a success. Dr. Francisca James Hernandez, 
head of the Department of Ethnic, Gender, and Transborder Studies, Sociology. Marcos Trujillo, instructional faculty in Sociology and Gender and Women's Studies. And Dr. Tiffany Amarete Young, instructional faculty in Sociology and coordinator of the African American Studies Discipline at Pima. Thank you for your leadership. Past Raquel Rubio Goldsmith lectures have brought nationally prominent leaders from the worlds of education, history, poetry, politics, and film to Tucson and Pima. Tonight's speaker, Karen Washington, is a farmer and nationally recognized community activist dedicated to rooting out racism and injustice in the food system. Ms. Washington's activism resonates with me on a personal level. My father's family were farmers in Chile, and my mother's family were farm workers here in the Southwest. Bringing speakers such as Ms. Washington to Pima is critical to providing our learners and community with an education that promotes their full participation and understanding of democracy. EGTSS is critical to the community and to the college's goal of serving as an instrument of social justice. The past few years have brought to the forefront the political, economic, and social inequities that exist in the U.S. Also, the controversy over critical race theory makes the work of EGTSS more relevant than ever. The data show that learners from marginalized communities who take EGTSS courses have higher rates of completion and success and develop a greater appreciation for their communities, histories, and themselves. The data also show that all EGTSS learners develop a greater understanding of racial, ethnic, gender, and sexuality differences and become more civically engaged. I would like to conclude with the words of Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor. It is important for all of us to appreciate where we come from and how that history has really shaped us in ways that we might not understand. These words echo those of my mother, who would remind me frequently not to ever forget where our family came from. Events such as the Raquel Rubio Goldsmith Lecture enhance our understanding of the past and present so that we may create a better future for everyone. Enjoy. Wonderful. Thank you to the Chancellor. And I also skipped over a little announcement that I should have given you earlier. We are making an effort to make our events more sustainably conscious. And so one of the ways that we decided to do that was foregoing a printed program. The little QR codes you see taped to the back of the chairs, if you scan those with the camera on your phone, will provide you access to a digital program where you can get more information about our keynote speaker, more information about our department faculty, and then a couple of links that we'll mention a little bit later. Um, next, we have our department head and one of the founders of our department, Francisca James Hernandez, who will give you a little bit of history and perspective about our department and sort of how these events fit into the work that we do. So thank you, Francisca. Thank you, Marcos. Thank you, Marcos. And welcome everybody, muy bienvenido, muy bienvenidos y bienvenidas to our seventh annual Raquel Rubio Goldsmith Lecture in Ethnic, Gender, and Transborder Studies. It is so exciting, it is so wonderful and beautiful to see all of you out there in the audience and to be helping us to, um, you know, come back from out of our COVID shells a little bit and to start creating these live communities, which was one of the uh, conscious goals of us creating this event along with the summit in the spring, to create a community here at Pima 
where uh, both you know, people from Pima, employees, staff, faculty, administrators, and students could come together along with people from the community locally, uh, nationally, globally to, uh, to, to learn, right? To, to have a kind of pedagogical educational experience in public education um, in which education is a phenomenon that happens with everybody, not just a select few, but that it involves everybody. So thank you for being a part of this. Got my dropped phone. Um, I just wanted to share with all of you a little bit more about our department. Um, that we began as a department in the fall of 2017 under the approval of then Chancellor Lee Lambert and his executive leadership uh, team, which included the current uh, interim chancellor, Dr. Dolores Duran Cerda. We are part of the Associates in Liberal Arts. We house this uh, array of disciplines in ethnic and gender studies, American Indian studies, Mexican American studies, gender and women's studies, global transborder studies and sociology, and our newest discipline, African American studies as of 2021. And so what is EGTSS? I mean, as, as a compilation of disciplines, right, we are that. But we are also much more than that philosophically. Because we represent this array of interdisciplinary courses that center the histories, cultures, socioeconomics, politics, and identities of people of color and those of multiple gender and, uh, gender and sexuality identities and relay that in our own terms of what that means rather than having that interpreted through the eyes and experiences of others. Um, our courses explore stories, social movements, diasporas, achievements and struggles of historically marginalized peoples in the, U in the U.S while attending to regional and global experiences and perspectives. And just as, as a uh, point of curiosity, raise your hand if you've ever taken one of the ethnic studies or a gender and women's studies course in your life. Raise your hand if you've ever done that. Excellent. A lot of you, a lot of you have done that. So, and I guess that's not surprising, right, given the event and, 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 uh, and given our audience. But we're going to need to uh, rely on you to help us, right, and I'll tell you about that. So we are, as a department, encouraging students uh, to critically evaluate the social construction of ethnicity, race, class, gender, sexuality, nationality, and their intersections in order to better understand themselves and society to make more enlightened choices. Our department and our disciplines prepare students to become agents of change in their families, communities, and institutions locally and globally on behalf of a democratic and socially just society. And for those of you who raised your hands, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, that this was something you were exposed to, at least in your classes, and I'm sure many other places as well. I like this uh, graphic because um, I don't know how many of you had this experience when you told people you wanted to take an ethnic studies class, but here we have this young person saying, I kind of think that might be cool, right, to take an ethnic studies course. And we have the parental figure, right, concerned about the practicalities of, of life, right, which is important, but they are discouraging in, in their response, saying, when will you ever use that, right? Yet we are bombarded daily, multiple times a day, with issues going on in our lives, in our world, that ethnic and gender studies deals with directly and helps us to cope with, helps us to understand, and therefore helps us to engage and be part of a solution, right? We are as much threatened by uh, losing our democracy as we are with finding a living wage, right? And I have a hard time um, ranking which one is more important, right? I think, I think we can find 
importance in, in both of these things and be able to fulfill them as an educational institution. So um, Dr. Duran Cerda mentioned some of these things already about the, the uh, documentation, the research findings of the value of ethnic studies and gender studies, which, which is often called diversity studies in the literature. Um, those who participate in these studies are challenged to critically and creatively think for studying social and cultural relationships. Um, the research has demonstrated that students uh, are more academically engaged, have higher academic achievement and personal empowerment. Uh, they maintain better grades, stay in school, and graduate at higher rates. Um, they close the achievement gap between Mexican Americans and Anglos, something that we at our college are particularly concerned about. Uh, and it helps to cultivate value and respect for difference and diversity and enhances civic engagement. Uh, our disciplines and our department by extension develops productive residents and citizens in a diverse and globalizing world and informed and active citizenry and challenges racism, sexism, classism, homophobia, xenophobia, and their resurgence in US society. So we align with uh, the college's strategic plan and the chancellor's top three priorities, at least up until the most recent chancellor, who I can't imagine, also, I know, also values these top three priorities of student success, community engagement, and responsiveness to a diverse community in which we live. Uh, speaking of which, just by way of reminder, um, the context in which we operate is key right, is crucial. Remembering that our community, our wider Tucson community, is basically half Hispanic, which according to the US 2020 census, 90% uh, of the Hispanic po population is Mexican ethnic or Mexican ancestry. So when we are talking about the Hispanic population in Tucson, we're talking about basically Mexican Americans, right, or people of Mexican descent. Our student population, uh, reflects that very direct, directly, and of course we are a Hispanic serving institution in HSI. We are, as uh, Marcos uh, acknowledged, uh, that we are on historically indigenous lands of the Tohono O'odham and share with the Pascua Yaqui tribe and are a state that, that is home to 22 different tribal nations. Tucson is the fifth poorest city in the U.S., above, 200 and f above a quarter of a million people. Um, that also is a critical, crucial context in which we operate, as well as being in a state that is historically uh, hostile legislatively to ethnic studies and to public education generally in recent decades, which has led to um, our teacher crisis in the state, right? Our, the scarcity of, of teachers. And um, was also the context in which our department emerged, right? When, when Mexican American Studies was abolished at TUSD, uh, some of us here at the college took that as like to, to get our butts in gear and, do, and take it to the next level, that we had to uh, activate ourselves and resist that kind of oppression, resist that kind of um, attempt to silence us by creating something more institutionalized. And that's how we came up with the department. These are some of the faculty uh, leaders of the department, most of whom are here tonight. I invite you to uh, contact us, speak with us after uh, today's, tonight's event or contact us by email at any time. We are available to help you um, and to answer your questions and to help advise you and mentor you. Um, we work with internal and external community partners. That's a key part of who we are as a department. We're in many ways non-traditional as an academic department uh, in the ways that we foster internal and external relationships um, through things like tonight's event. Uh, we have, uh, we work in statewide alliances, including the articulation task forces, which 
help students uh, to transfer their credits from Pima to the universities. We were uh, part of leading the formation, the foundation of the Art Articulation Task Force for Ethnic Studies. Um, and then we also um, have our events, like we've mentioned. Um, here's a wonderful photo of our founding mother. Founding mother of Pima and of Ethnic Studies at, at Pima. Uh, we, uh, we've had our summit and our lecture tonight for about seven or eight years, uh, pretty much consecutively with maybe one or two years uh, with, due, due to COVID that we did not. Um, and finally, I want to draw your attention to this flyer. Hopefully you all got it when you registered or it's next to you or by you. Uh, please take one on your way out if you don't have it. Uh, this is fresh, hot off the presses. It tells you about our department. On the back side, it has um, uh, the list of classes that we're offering in spring, uh, what gen ed requirements they fulfill, what modalities they're being taught in, which campuses, has a, a lot of information. Um, and I want to also draw your attention to the scholarships. That's something else that we have established as a department. We have two scholarships with the help of community partners like Fundacion Mexico and Florencio Zaragoza, who helped us establish one of these scholarships. Um, we're very happy and proud to say that we award scholarships on a semester basis and all a student has to do is successfully complete one of our courses and have a 2.5 GPA in order to be eligible to apply. So that's also here on the uh, flyer. And with that, I would like to introduce to you one of our students who is here to read a statement from another student who is a scholarship recipient who could not be here tonight, but who wrote a statement and, um, and uh, for, for uh, one of our other students, Allison, come on up, Allison, for Allison to read for all of us. Thank you, Allison, for agreeing to be here and for reading this statement for Michael Cuestas, I believe is Michael's name. Michael yes, okay. Dear Dr. Hernandez, the Department of Ethic, Ethnic, Gender, and Transborder Studies, Sociology, EGTSS, and Donors. I am writing to express my deepest gratitude for the incredible honor of being selected as recipient of the Department of Ethnic, Gender, and Transborder Studies of Sociology Scholarship for the fall 2023 semester. The impact of this scholarship on my life is immeasurable. I am truly humbled and thankful for the support you have provided. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Michael Cuestas, and I am the father of two wonderful boys, four and six. Balancing the responsibilities of parenthood with my pursuit of higher education has both been challenging and rewarding. The scholarship from EGTSS has not only alleviated some of the financial burdens associated with pursuing a degree, but has also provided me with the, an opportunity to fulfill a dream that expands beyond myself. I am currently enrolled at Pima Community College, where I'm working towards an associate in networking and cyber defense, AAS program. My ultimate goal is to transfer to the University of Arizona to per pursue a bachelor's degree in network administration. The support I have received through this scholarship is making a significant difference in my ability to realize these aspirations. The financial assistance is not only helping cover tuition, but is also enabling me to focus more on my studies and in turn, be present for my boys. As a father, my primary motivation for pursuing this educational path is to create a better future for my family. This scholarship has become a beacon of hope, illuminating the path towards providing a stable and secure life for my, future, my children. Your generosity has eased the financial strain on our family, allowing me to dedicate more time and energy to my studies, ensuring that I can excel in my chosen field and ultimately secure a promising career. The EGTSS scholarship is more than just financial assistance. It represents a community that believes in transformative power of education and the potential for positive change. It has given me the confidence to dream bigger and work harder towards achieving my goals. I am truly grateful for the opportunities this scholarship has opened up for me and my family. 
I want to express to my deepest appreciation to you, the donors, and the entire Department of Ethnic, Gender, Transborder Studies, and Sociology for investing in my education and future. Your generosity is not only impacting my life, but also creating a ripple effect that will undoubtedly touch the lives of my children and community. Thank you once again for your unwavering support and belief in my potential. I am continued to making the most, I am committed to making the most of this opportunity and in the future, paying it forward to help others achieve the dreams just as you have helped me. With sincere gratitude, Michael Cuestas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allison. And I neglected to mention that Allison is a student in one of our gender and women's studies courses, Introduction to Feminist Studies. If you would like to help other students and contribute to our scholarship funds, there's a couple ways you can do that. You have, there's this uh, piece of paper floating around. It's at the registration table. Um, you can just go to the QR code and donate there. Um, we're, we also sell t-shirts, and we would love for you to purchase one of our t-shirts. It's $25 or 20 for students. So those are ways that you can contribute. Thank you. Oh, please don't let it hit me in the face. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're so happy you're here this evening. My name is Sherry Stewart, and I teach and am the discipline coordinator for American Indian Studies. And uh, isn't my department head a hard act to follow? Um, I'm really pleased to be here tonight and to inform you, tell you a little bit about our discipline, American Indian Studies. American Indian Studies provides a way for students to see history, cultural, culture, global issues through a different lens. It helps them see different peoples, different ways of knowing, and they carry that out into the world so that they can understand all the issues that are going on today. I'd like to highlight one class, and we have several of them. They go all the way from an introductory class to courses talking about the autumn and or the Pasquayaki to a general view of Native peoples that live across the Southwest. But this class is entitled Native Histories of North America. And the, it includes not only the United States, but Canada, Alaska, Hawaii, Mexico, the Caribbean, and their histories and how Native peoples have survived through colonization. This also is a class that has been converted to online educational resources so our students do not have to buy a textbook. <clears throat> and we all know that, just as Allison just read to us, that every bit that we can do to help our students as financially is another way that we help them succeed in the world. I just want to say thank you for everyone being here. And if you want to take an American Indian Studies course, grab me by the elbow. I'd love to talk to you about it. Thank you so much. All right, you already know me. You heard about me. I do sociology and gender studies. 
Love to see you in a class of mine. Come chat with me. Unfortunately, one of our colleagues, Dr. Elizabeth Gaxiola, is unable to be here in attendance. She represents our Mexican-American Studies Department and American Indian Studies and coordinates Mexican-American Studies. As you were coming in before the event, if you saw the PowerPoint slideshow where that was rotating with some artwork, all of those were posters that were created in Elizabeth's class by students who were learning about Latin American activism and were encouraged to think about what is a social justice issue that you want to educate people about and creating your own artwork and political poster to engage people. And so you saw some of those before in the PowerPoint. We'll put it up afterwards. And as you're leaving, there's a handful of posters that are also physical out in the atrium here. And so take a look at them and just get an idea of some of the cool and creative ways that our professors are not only encouraging people to engage their own identity and experiences, but thinking about how we can share and communicate that with other people. So we miss you, Liz. Hope you're feeling better soon. And next we will hear from Dr. Tiffany Amorete Young. Hello, good people. You can hear me real good, right? Okay, good. So yes, I am a Dr. Tiffany Amaret Young. I like that doctor title. So, you know, worked real hard for it. And I wondered how can I bring what I learned into the classroom in a meaningful way? And one of the things that I like to explore is food. All right, we all have this awesome relationship to food. You probably saw that I was a little bit more than energetic when we were outside having those mini chimichangas um, and welcoming people because uh, there's really nothing that is more precious than nurturing people, right? And nourishing them uh, intellectually and with our stomachs. So one of the research projects that I've introduced into my current social problems class is you, food, and society. We activate our sociological imaginations and we explore foodways all the way to the global food system. Some really big conceptual things that we do through food. Not all of you in the audience may be familiar with what the sociological imagination is, so I'm gonna give you a really quick definition. Uh, C. Wright Mills coined the term, it is the ability to see societal patterns that influence not just the individual, but groups of people. And it situates these processes within a historical context, right? It's very difficult to understand what we see without having situated it historically. How did we come to be where we are today? And we can do this with even food, right? Something as simple and universal. So my students explore some of their personal troubles and they connect them to public issues. And this research project was a way to explore micro, which means individual, and macro, which is like big issues. And we honored our experiences and histories surrounding food. How do we do this? Well, one, I can't forget about water. Water is life, right? And so my students, as a research community, they research water. You know, what is our access to water now? What's in our water? What is the future of water? And how can we protect that future and the sanctity of life? I also um, have three awesome projects that my students get to choose from. They get to choose one of these three field notes. They can document their food and drink consumption just as they typically would live, right? Just to kind of think a little bit about what are some of the things informing my decisions about food? and what I'm drinking. And if that's not something that sits well with people, because not all of us have a positive relationship with food, they can also choose to regrow kitchen scraps, which allows you to kind of explore the regenerative, awesome properties of plants. And they can also start or revive a food garden and document their experiences with that. When my students elect to do that, I offer them the soil and I offer them the seeds. And the seeds actually come from Native Seed Search. It was a seed community grant that I secured. So we make sure that we're not bringing in invasive species, that we're honoring the plants that were meant to be here, and that we're touching the soil and we're reclaiming our relationship with something that's so intimate to us, feeding and food. And then finally, as a class, we do the seed bomb activity. 
And my students, some of you are in here. We just finished this activity. I got some clay from Tucson Co-op Clay. I like, they're a really cool organization, by the way. They're on Dodge. And I've got some soil. And we got some native wildflower seeds, again, courtesy of Native Seed Search. And we get our hands dirty with a little bit of water. And we create seed bombs. And these seed bombs are preserved by the clay. And you can plant them. You can also throw them in vacant lots. You can beautify a space. And when the monsoon, when the rains hit, the clay gives way, and the soil nurtures and germinates the seeds. And if just one of my students can plant a plant that's going to help the birds, that's going to help the bees, that's going to honor the world that we live in now, that plant will give more seeds. And those seeds will give more seeds. And it's a beautiful process, OK? And I just wanted to be really quick and share with you, how do we explore food in the sociology class? And this is a picture of us doing our seed bombs outside. It's become kind of popular. We repurpose things like egg cartons that are biodegradable. And we come together, and we really just get our hands dirty. And it's lots of fun. So I leave my students with this. It does take a lot of time to get here, but everyone has a relationship to food. Everybody eats. And while food is personal and seemingly universal, it's also politically, culturally, biologically, historically, and an economically situated experience. And it has profound consequences for equity, for justice, and for environmental sustainability. And I want to give a special thanks to Native Seed Search, uh, LWAC, and also the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, Open Pedagogy Faculty Fellowship, who all really helped me think about these assignments and how to make sure that all my students are comfortable doing these assignments in a way that still enriches their lives and honors their experiences with food and seeds and our land. Before I go, I want to bring some attention to the ARC Food Pantry. Um, if you open our digital program, there is a link. And there is a link so that you can donate to the ARC Food Pantry. This was a faculty and a student-led initiative from the social, science, social services program. And this program here at Pima started at West Campus, and then it expanded to Desert Vista, and then it expanded again to east, and we're real close to getting to downtown and northwest. But we need your help, because this is something that relies pretty heavily on our, our charity, our willingness to give. Um, campus, uh, college campus food insecurity is a, is a national issue, right? About 56% of community college students in our nation are food insecure. And about 52% of the community college students are housing insecure. So again, this is just another way that if you are willing, if you are able, please give to our community in a meaningful way. All this to say that this focus on food is why I decided, uh, along with the group, to invite our keynote speaker, Karen Washington, here today. Uh, She's very, very humble, and I was so happy to get to know her um, over the course of the last few months. And I have to, I've got to highlight just some of her recognitions and awards. Uh, in 2012, Ebony Magazine voted her one of their 100 most influential African Americans in the country. In 2014, she was the recipient of the James Beard Leadership Award in 2019, she co-founded Black Farmer Fund, aimed specifically at supporting black farms and businesses with capital and resources in New York State. In 2020, Essence Magazine named Karen one of their Essential Heroes recipients. And in 2021, Forbes Magazine named Karen as one of their 50 over 50 impact leaders. She was also awarded the Black Women Green Future Award, the Thurgood Marshall Academy Community Garden Dedication, and the Green Thumbs Lifetime Achievement Award in 2021. 
And in 2023, she was the recipient of the James Beard Humanitarian Award and the Scenic Hudson Farmer and Food Access Advocate Award in 2023. So please join me now in welcoming our keynote speaker, Karen Washington, to the stage. Testing. All right. Can you, can you advance the thing? Hello, everybody. Don't believe the hype. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm very humbled. You know, I, I just want to say, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you, um, Dr. Tiffany Young, for reaching out to me. The reason why I'm here is because somebody took the time to invite me. And that's the thing that a lot of us don't do when we look around and we see who is missing. So if you look around and you see that people need to be here, reach out to them. So thank you so much for allowing me to be here. So I'm going to, I guess I'll take you on a journey on how I got to become a farmer. Believe it or not, my parents weren't farmers. My grandparents weren't farmers. My mom was a good cook. Three meals a day, she was a slamming good cook. But I never questioned, I never questioned where the food came from, who grew it. Was it sprayed with pesticides or insecticides? All I knew is that the food tastes good. And so I'm going to just show you my journey on how I became a farmer, how I became a, a food activist. And hopefully somebody in this audience one day will be standing up here talking about their experience about growing food and being an, act, an activist. Nope. Oh, that way? Can you advance it for me if I say? Okay, just, right, just. Right, so the World Food Summit says this. It defines food security as existing when all people at all times have access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food to maintain a healthy and active lifestyle. Don't believe the hype. Next slide. And so for me, my relationship to food was, it came from a store and it had beautiful colors and that meant that if it had beautiful colors, it must be good, right? Because it was the United States, it was the Food and Drug Administration deeming the fact that the food that we were eating was healthy but it sort of looked good, the colors. And just think about how the colors of non-nutritional food emulates the colors of our vegetables. And for me, land, heck no. Land, farming was slave work. And who would want to go back to doing slave work? So my relationship to food and land was that it was from a grocery store. It had no nutritional value. And my relationship to land was... It was slave work, and I wasn't going back to be a slave. Next slide. So in 1985, I was able to buy a brand new house. Two children, single parent, brand new house. American dream, no picket fence, but I had my house. But across the street, where it was supposed to be additional homes, was an empty lot. And if you can look at this photo, believe it or not, as I go across the country, you can still see communities that have empty lots. And so people who could not move stay. Those that move who had power and privilege, they call it white flight. They left. And they left a community that was devastated. Next slide. But what we did, what we did is we turned those communities, turn those empty lots into community gardens and urban farms. And at that time, the city had no resources. So this is sweat equity, y'all. This is sweat equity. People coming together to turn something that was horrible into something that was beautiful. But it wasn't about food, per se. What it was, it was about getting people to understand their relationship to their community, to take something that was ugly and making something that was beautiful, a place for senior citizens, and a place for children, understanding where their food came from, but understanding their culture. Next slide. And whenever you try to do something, 
people of color, whenever we try to do something to benefit ourselves, there's always political consequences. And so in 1998, your mayor, Giuliani, decided he's going to auction off 100 community gardens. Now, you say to yourself, well, we took these empty lots and we made beautiful community gardens. You figured that we were helping the city. But he was in bed with the developers. And as a result, he figured in the dead of, at dead of night, he's going to auction off and bulldoze community gardens. And back then, we didn't understand the political consequences of growing food and land. And as a result, we started to galvanize. We started to organize. And we started to march on the steps of City Hall. We got not only community gardeners, but we got housing advocates. We had businesses understanding the importance of people of color reclaiming land to grow food for their community. And we were able to get the ear of the, at the attorney general at that time was Ellie Spitzer, who said what the mayor did was wrong, and we were able to save those community gardens. However, 2023, throughout the country, even though there is urban ag movement and community gardens movement, whenever there's land in any municipality, it has political consequences. And you must be proactive to make sure that that land that you're growing food maintains and stays within your community. And so the fight continues. The fight continues throughout this country when it comes to land ownership. Next slide. And so for me, while I was in my garden growing my food, you know, understanding, the, you know, where food came from, and as a result, you know, how did I really get involved? And I want to just sort of go back and tell the story because it was a tomato that really got me involved because a tomato for me was pink. It tastes like cardboard, and it came three in a cellophane package. But once I started putting that seed in the ground and I nurtured that, that, that plant, I said, wow, a tomato is red. It grows on a vine. It's a fruit, and when I bit into it, oh my goodness, I taste something I could never, never dreamed of. And I wanted to grow everything from pineapples to avocados and even mangoes, but in New York you can't grow those things. But I never lost the passion of growing food. And so while I had this passion of growing food, I realized within my community gardens there were so many social issues that were out there, social issues around the environment around education, around so many things, economics. And so realize that food was at the center of so many things. It made, it made me realize that I could not just concentrate on food, and food doesn't just stand alone. Next slide. And so for me, I started hearing people saying that the food system is broken and needed to be fixed. How many of you, raise your hands, believe that the food system is broken and need to be fixed? Yeah, I believe that too. I was believing that too, especially when people were saying, well, in order for people to be food insecure, all they have to do is grow some food, drink some water, exercise, and voila, they'll be food secure without looking at the structural, the structural determinants that reinforce racism in today's society. Next slide. And so if you look at the food system, it's in four quadrants. Production, processing, distribution, and consumption. On one side, you have the movers and you have the shakers. You have the shapers, policy, and climate. You have the movers, labor, energy, and waste, fueled by land and resources. Next slide. However, early 1900s, we had over 5 million farms, 70% of our food was homegrown, came from farms. 40% 40, 40 of our population lived on farms. And black farmers at one time had 14 million acres of land. And now only 2% of people live on farms. And for black farmers, we own less than 1% of land. Next slide. And so what has happened? Well, as we've gone away from the land, we've seen how we have lost land. 
Black folks have lost land. There is a 13 to 1 wealth gap when it comes to the economic development of land and, 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 and power in this country. Next slide. <clears throat> and so what do people do? They left the South. They left the South. Can you believe back in, in the early 1900s, there were more black farmers than white farmers. There were more black wealth than white farmers. But yet because of Jim Crow, black codes, discrimination, segregation, people had to leave the South. They had to leave their land. And they called it the Great Migration as they left the South to come to the North, to inner cities, to try to find jobs to try to find a peace of mind. And many of my family and a lot of our family members left that land, left that land because of prosecution to go to North to try to find a better way of living. Next slide. <clears throat> and yet, we have a food system rooted in cheap labor that exploits the same people that it's trying to feed. Think about that. Next slide. And so what have we done? What have we done? Well, folks, we have given up our power. We have given up our power to big businesses, big food companies. 7.8 billion people on this planet. 7.8 billion people on this planet and a handful of companies control our food system. Where is the outrage? You have companies that are patenting our seeds. Seeds, who are we? Aren't we seeds? We have allowed companies to patent our seeds, controlling our food system, and where is the outrage? By 2025, we'll have an additional two billion people on this planet, nine billion people on the planet, and yet we have allowed a handful of companies to control our food system, to target our food system. And you know who the biggest target is? It's our children. Because when they go to the grocery store and they see the colors, right, they get mom and they get dad to buy those food. Saturday morning cartoons, what do you see? Cereals, all of that. But where is the agency? Where is the outrage for us to be proactive instead of reactive? Next slide. And so for me, I've been working on the pillars of what food means to me in terms of food justice, food sovereignty, and food apartheid. So let's take food justice. How many of you have heard the term food justice? Yeah, a lot of you heard the term food justice, right? So food justice for me is trying to eliminate the, the disparities we often see in food. However, I tell people, huh, it doesn't exist. Why? Because food justice is a movement. Food justice is a movement. So if you are doing food justice work, you have to be actively participating in dismantling the social injustices that you see. Instead of just saying the definition of food justice in a way to make yourself feel good, but yet you're not actively participating in dismantling the social injustices that you see. How about food sovereignty? Well, after people start saying they know a lot about food justice, they say bring on food sovereignty to take it up another level that I know. Well, folks, food sovereignty has been co-opted. Food sovereignty started in the global south of peasants who for so long have been working on resiliency, ownership of land, ownership of food, ownership of their own culture. And so if we're talking about food sovereignty, let's give credit to those peasants that for so long have been working against the injustices in the food system, wanting to claim back their land, their heritage, their culture, and own it, instead of seeing it being co-opted. In the last food apartheid, well, I coined that term food apartheid because someone told me that I lived in a food desert. Hmm, I don't know, maybe here in Tucson, maybe a desert? But in New York City, I can't understand why did I hear that I live in a food desert when I looked around and I say, wait a second, we got a lot of food because the definition of food desert is, is that you live in a place where you have limited access to food or you have to walk far to a grocery store. 
when in fact, we got a lot of food. We got the fast food. We got the junk food. We have unhealthy food. So I coined the term food apartheid because I said, wait a second, folks. Is that a desert? I said, it's an injustice. And I coined that term because I wanted people to start talking about the injustices that we see in the food system. The injustices we see when it comes to race, ethnicity, demographics, economics, those hard conversations that we continue, we must continue to have if we are going to correct the food system. Next slide. And so I asked you in the very beginning, if, is, if the food system is broken and need to be fixed, and you raise your hands? And I said, no, it doesn't need to be fixed because it's doing exactly what it's doing. It's a care system. So does the food system need to be fixed? No. The food system needs to change. And that change is shifting power from a handful of people Back into, the back into the hands of the community. For so long, we have been complacent and silent. But in order for us to change the food system, it comes from us. It comes from us being actively involved in changing the food system as a community. And time and time again, you're going to get flack because people with power and privilege, oh boy, they don't want to, they don't want to give that up. Power is like a drug. It's like a drug. It's like, oh, oh I, I, can't, I can't give you my power because if I give you my power, what's, what's going to happen to me? Well, you know what? I tell people with power and privilege, you got three things. Either you're going to give it up, hard to do. Mm, you're going to share it. Or we're going to take it away from you, and that's going to be the next food revolution. Because you cannot continue to put people, people into poverty and hunger. You cannot continue to do that millions and millions of people without an upsurge of change. And I'm starting to see that. And I'm starting to see that with young people out in the street exercising their right for change. And we need to do that. You need to understand that that in order for the food system to shift, we as a people collectively have to get off our butts to make change, to be proactive instead of reactive, to be less relaxed and complacent, to be more vocal and to stand up for what you think is right and not be fearful of standing up for what you feel is right. Next slide. And so now people understand, wait a second, what have indigenous people been telling us all along? That food is medicine. You know, I was talking to a lot of my patients. I used to be a physical therapist, so I had a chance to talk to a lot of my patients. And they would tell me, I said, tell me some story. And they would say, Ms. Washington, we were never sick a day in our life because we went out into the farm in the fields. And we got that plant. And we got that leaf. And we got that root of medicine that made us well. And people started to understand, we never went to a grocery store. We got our food from the farm, from the garden. And back then we understood the leverage of power that we have because we were controlling our medicinal wealth and we were controlling our food system. Next slide. And land, all of a sudden, all of a sudden people are waking up about the power of land. We talk about reparations we're talking about reparations for black and indigenous people, and people are getting scared because that means like, oh, does that mean that you're taking away my land? No. We need to have that conversation because is it your land? Because when we talk about land ownership, I want people to understand that we have to get away from that word ownership because we don't own anything. We don't live long enough to own anything. So why do we always talk about owning land? Right? Owning this. Own it. We don't live long enough to own anything. So when I talk about land, I try to now use the word, I want to be a steward of the land. And by a steward of the land, I can take care of the land. And by taking care of the land, I know that I can give that land back to generations and generations to come because I know they're going to take care of the land. 
So don't use the word owning. And when people ask you when, you, when it's time for your reparation, you say you want your land, you say, I don't want to own the land. I want to be a steward of the land and take care of the land. Totally different, totally different context. Next slide. And so what are people are doing? So in my hood in the Bronx, we started understanding, wait a second, it's not only about growing food, but what about the economic power in growing food? You know, for so long, living in the Bronx, people always talked about, well, you know, if you want some food, here is the soup kitchens and food pantries, all well and good. They're supposed to be for emergency purposes. But people want to be able to make something. You know, no one never came into the hood to talk about investment, how to save, how to, prepare, how to repair credit, how to own something, how to own a business. Again, the mentality of keeping people of color, marginalized community down without giving them a chance to provide their own ownership of owning a job or a business. So we started the Bronx Hot Sauce, and now the hot sauce is all across the country now of growing serrano peppers, habanero peppers, jalapeno peppers, and turning that into hot sauce of which the money goes back into the community garden. For the first time, people understanding economic power for them, by their hands, for their community, that that money is being generated. But that's not really talked about in our community. We're never in the, in the conversation around economic power and economic wealth. Why? Because as long as we are poor and sick, someone is making money off of us. Think about that. Next slide. Y'all got me going. Hold on a second. Let me get some water. Y'all got to drink some water. Y'all got me going. So what are people doing around the country? Because if you're waiting for the government to fix things, you're going to be waiting a long time. So you have people now getting involved in urban agriculture, getting involved in community garden, getting involved in school gardens, growing food on rooftops, on walls, you name it, farmers markets, right, CSAs. They're taking the initiative because they know that their community needs food. And they're not waiting for a government to come with the white horse and drop what? They're taking upon their own initiative to start doing things because they know that their community needs to be fed. And so they're taking the initiative to make change. Next slide. And so people are marching the street. They're understanding the power, the, 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 the power of collective knowledge and power to make change. Talking about land loss, talking about food chain workers, talking about labor, talking about farmers, talking about Black Lives Matter and taking it to the street and being very vocal about it. Next slide. And yet we still have a problem within this country when it comes to wealth. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know what, um, you know, I, I, I got, you know, they, these people here, they come here and they want a handout, but you know what, they got to work hard because, you know, I worked hard all my life, and this is what I, but, but the thing about it, a lot of white folks, y'all got help, y'all had help. We didn't have help. And so you have to understand, if you had help already, we're trying to catch up. We're trying to catch up, and people have to understand, in order for this country to grow when it comes to wealth, you have to help the people at the bottom, but people get scared because if I'm going to help the people at the bottom, that means that I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm giving something away. Something's being taken away from me when in essence, when you help the lower rung of people to raise up, you in turn raise up too. Duh. But yet there's fear. There is a constant fear that if you help marginalized people in the community, that they're taking something away from you. When in fact, if you help marginalized community to raise up, to be more proactive, you in turn benefit as well. And that's the mindset we have to start thinking about. Not deficit, but abundance. Get out of the mentality of deficit and get into the mentality of abundance. Helping the lower rung of people achieve wealth you become more wealthier. Next slide. And so, yes, start a Black Farmer Fund. Start a Black Farmer Fund because in New York State, out of 57,000 farmers, only 139 are black. 
57,000 farmers, 139 are black. Average farmer makes between $20,000, $40,000. Average black farmer, maybe $950. And so we took it upon ourselves to say, wait a second, there's a discrepancy here. How do we start a fund by the people, for the people, that talks about what investments looks like? How to invest? How to repair credit? How to be able to go and make sure that farms and businesses succeed? You go into a bank, what's the first thing they're going to ask you? Wait a second, they may say, hi, how are you? The next thing they're going to say, how's your credit? And as a farmer, if you don't have good credit, you're already behind the eight ball. So either you're going to be denied credit or you're going to have an interest rate that's so high that you know you're going to fail. And so what our fund is trying to do is let's work with the farmer and let's work with the business. Because most farmers in New York State, they don't farm all year round because of the winter. So you're not asking for that monthly check in December, January, February when it's cold and no one is working. Let's work with you and let's work with you so that when you are productive, you can pay back that loan or we can give you a grant. And yet the decision-making process is not the, not the board or the people that work, it's the community. It's the community that's making the decisions on what farms and what businesses get funding. Unheard of. Who gives community power to make decisions? We do, to understand that it's power, it's, it's investment, it's, we call it social capital and communal wealth. Those are the terms that we use. When you have, again, community understanding the power, collective power to make change. And this idea just came out of, you know how this idea came out? We were in a room and we were talking about you know, we don't get any resources, nothing happened, and people are sitting, I said, you're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting for the, the night and shiny army? That's not going to happen. Let's have a conversation within ourselves. Let's start talking about community wealth and social capital. Just for example, if everybody in this room, just think, if everybody in this room gave $5 every month, what do you think would happen? You can help that farmer that needed land. You can help that gardener that needed seeds, but we don't think about our, co our collective power of bringing our resources together to make change. Why? Because for so long we have been in institutionalized to think about crabs in a barrel. We have, we have been brainwashed to thinking about, well, if I get, I, I can't give them, or, um, you know, if I get, you know, I'm going to keep it to myself. And we have to break that cycle, especially in marginalized community, because the only people we got is ourselves. That's all we got. And so if we can start thinking about collective power, helping each other rise up, we all benefit. And that's why this fund is so important. And people want to know, how does it work? It works on the basis of communal power, understanding collectively to make change. Next slide. And so, you know, when I do these talks, I always give y'all some homework, because you think I stand up here talking all this time without y'all going away with some takeaways? So, I got some homework and some takeaways that y'all need to do. Together, we can make change in the food system by speaking up and advocating for the support and rights of farm workers, restaurant workers, because all of a sudden, and grocery workers, all of a sudden, they became essential workers overnight. They've been doing it, they're going to work for centuries. Support those working on access to land and affordable housing. You can't talk about land without talking about housing. You know, as I was coming in today, you know, the homeless population is horrible. It's horrible, not only here, but in New York City. I'm in, it's, it, I mean, tell me, tell me as a society, how we can see people living in streets, in cardboard boxes, and we just walk over. And it doesn't tear your heart to do something. We are, a, we are America. You know, this is a land of opportunity. And yet we have a homeless population that we are not recognizing, and we're not being vocal about it. 
and yet we step over and we see it and we turn our eye to it. And that fighting for a human life of seeing this population exploding right before our eyes. Be open to the idea of land reparation for those who've lost their land or had it stolen. And people, you know, with people with the land, y'all, don't get nervous. We talk about reparations because we're talking about a healthy conversation on how does that look like? How does it look to have land returned back to indigenous and black folks? You know, let's, let's have that healthy conversation without people running scared that they're going to take away my land, they're going to take away my land, when in fact, a lot of that land y'all got, you know, y'all started stolen and wasn't given to you. Demand healthy food and clean water, both are human rights. The right to save seas. Darn it, how we allow companies to patent seeds? And yet, those companies that have patent seeds, if by chance the pollination of the seed goes on your property, they say they own it. How, do, how, how have we allowed the government to say that someone owns nature? When are we going to start fighting for nature? But there are people that are starting to fight for nature because they understand that someone has to have a voice because it seeds today, water tomorrow. Next slide. Speak up against hazardous working conditions in major food facilities and businesses. Why do we have to see on TV that someone got injured? And if you've seen on TV, you know it happens every minute right now. Something's happened. Someone's being injured at one of these facilities. Make sure your elected official account. How many, how many of you all vote? How many of you all vote? Okay. How many of you know all your legislative people? Let me tell you something. When I was in New York, I knew everybody from council person, senator, um, assembly person. I knew them a congressman. I knew them all. You know why? Because I felt that it was my duty to pick up the phone and call, excuse me, my name is Karen Washington. I'd like to come and see my senator, my council person. Who are you? Who, you bringing a lot of people? Nope, I'm bringing myself because I want to sit down and I want to talk because I want to find out exactly what he's doing for my neighborhood or she's doing for my neighborhood. Make them accountable. Invite them to your classes. You know, I used to uh, teach a class called advocacy at farm school and I would invite my politicians to come to the class and speak to the students and the students ask questions why you can't do that why can't your church or synagogue invite your local politicians to come in and put them on the stage and ask questions what are we afraid of make them you vote it make them accountable use your right use your God-given right to make change, to ask questions. Don't be afraid to do so. Speak up and speak out against injustice. Break bread or a meal with someone you don't know. Now, a lot of y'all know the neighbor down the road a piece that doesn't have food. How many of you have gone out shopping? You know, you know who you know who they are, or at school, the kids who are homeless, you know them. And yet, everybody shuns away. Break bread with someone you don't know. Invite someone to your dinner table. This is something so, so, so human that we can do. And yet, we know the elderly people that can't go to the store, but yet we refuse to go to the store. Or we know those students, and you know those students that don't have a meal or homeless, but yet, they're shameful, and, this, and, and to be hungry should not be shameful. You know, I go around to some of the colleges because now a lot of the colleges now have a, a food pantry program. So one of the advice they asked me, so Karen, how do you know, how can we implement this food pantry program? I said, first of all, don't call it a food pantry, duh. Don't, you know, because all of a sudden that is that food pantry thing on campus they're not gonna go. You know, it's, it's a shame. Call it a call it a grocery store and open it up to everybody. 
so that the person that needs, you know, that needs the food, everyone has the same card, but when that card is swiped, you don't know if the person is homeless or not. So think of innovative ways to expand your food pantry, make it a grocery store, and make it so that everybody has access to it, and not label it a food pantry, because labeling it, again, there's, there's trauma, and there's shame to that. Okay, strive for a community that cherishes diversity and inclusion. And you know what? All of a sudden, every business now has diversity and inclusion as part of their business. And I say, in order for diversity and inclusion to work, the people that you've hired, a person of color, an LGBTQ person, a woman, if they don't have the power to make change, then it's only tokenism and window dressing. So diversity and inclusion within your organization, if they're inviting you to be on their board or part of their program, you better make darn sure that your voice is there to make change. Because if you're just sitting there and they're just counting the numbers, and they can say, we got a woman, we got an LGBTQ person, we got a Bob, and you're not there making change vocally, get out, because there's nothing but window dressing and tokenism. Develop and support youth leadership. And I talk to my elders, okay, the elders in the room, elders out there, you all know how we get. We got to hold on to that power, because, you know, back in the day, you know, we don't do things like that anymore. The youth, we need youth leadership. I'm tired. I'll be almost 70. I'm tired. I need some youth. I need imagination. I need creativity. I need people to know how to do TikTok and Instagram and all that kind of, I, you know, I, I need these people. I mean, the youth, they're out there. They're brilliant. They know so much. They grew up in an, in an, in an atmosphere. From birth, they are, they are media savvy. Give them a chance. You can help them, but don't block. Get out the way. Really promote youth leadership. Next. I'm almost finished, y'all. I'm having fun. Next slide. So now I'm following my dream. So I left my home in the Bronx, and now I farm up state on six acres of land with my farming partners. It's in the black dirt of Orange County. We're talking about black dirt. That soil is 40% organic matter. Normal soil is maybe eight to ten percent organic 40 percent organic it is black gold we grow the best vegetables and the best weeds which i like weeds and lights and so i say we've traded our metro cars for tractors next slide and so i'm at rising roof farm we are rooted in equity and justice that is our value that is our motto come see us if you're ever in new york Next slide. The urgency of growing food is no longer a local movement, but a global one. The aim for cities and countries is not to grow to feed themselves, but to help build a food system in which people are fed and hunger and poverty are no more. Next slide. My name is Karen Washington. I'm, it's a pleasure for me being here to speak to you. And this is my roots. This is where I got started in the Garden of Happiness in the Boogie Down Bronx. Thank you all so much. I believe all the hype, Karen. I believe all the hype. Thank you so much for honoring us with your presence, with your intellect, with your experiences. I was definitely moved, and uh, everything you said resonated with me and uh, made me feel good about the work that, that we're doing. We're all doing good work out here, so yes. I would like to take the time to open it up for uh, questions and answers. This is your opportunity. We've got Karen here in person for you to ask any questions. Um, and if you do, I'll come to you. All right, Sherry, I'll give you the, the mic. Do you want the mic? It's right here. 
I don't know. I talk pretty good. Yes. So, Karen, um, we have an alley between my house, which is, you know, a string of houses, and the houses that back up to us. And I would like to clean it up and make it into a community garden. Do you know where I might start with that? That's a good question. Um, everyone heard what the question was? Okay, so I, I love this question because every place I go, the last per place I was in Delaware, they asked the same question. And I said, I'm from Georgia now and New York. And so you heard her question. The people in this audience, who can help help? Thanks, Sherry. Who can help Sherry with the community garden? What are no hands? Come on, hands up high, high. It's okay. So Sherry, you have one, two, can I hold those hands up high? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight people, nine, ten, ten people in the audience that can help you. So after this, reach out to Sherry. Sherry, you have people to help you. They're right here. I just counted ten. All right? My pleasure. But see, but see, that's what community, see, a lot of us don't know what we can do within our community. And so just by putting that out there, she got 10 people to help her with the garden. Lovely. Who's next? All your grow food. All right. Karen, great talk. Can you tell us more about your farm at the end, like yeah. where it is and yes. what you're growing and how many people you guys are employing and that kind of stuff? Yes. Thanks. So I used to be a physical therapist. I did that for 37 and a half years. It was the best profession. When I reached 60, I said, okay, I want to follow my dream to grow food along with my friends. So Jane was just leaving farm school. Um, Lori was coming back from a program out in California called CASFIS. Michaela was uh, ending her, starting her um, fermentation business. And so we took a chance. We went up and down the Hudson Valley. And in New York State, land is expensive. So we would go places and find that the land was, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars. One place is like, yeah, you can live, you can have this land, but you got to take care of my mother who has a house, <laughs> you know, down the road a piece. Or, you know, you can have this land, but we have a Christmas tree a business, so during the winter you got to do, yeah, so being, I mean, the, the hearts were good. And it was sometimes where, so Lori and I are black, Jane and Mikhail are white. And so there's sometimes when me and Lori would come out to see people and, the, and their faces change. And so we would sit, Lori and I would sit in the car and let Jane and Michaela go out first to meet people, and then we would come out. You know, let me tell you something. Being black, you know, you got to do it. Sometimes that's like what happens. But I'm going to tell you all something, what you got to do. Always put your dreams out to the open, to everywhere you go. We, I kept on saying, I want land, I want land. I'll be on panels, and these young whippersnappers getting land. I said, I ain't getting no land. They're getting land. I'm not get, I want land. And finally, someone heard me. Someone said, there's a project up in Chester that is looking for young farmers. Now, that, that, I was 60, so I was pretty young. I'm almost 70 now. And so we met this person at the diner. He talked about this project, and the rest is history. So now we have five acres. It's the Chester Agriculture Center, which started with a group of investors that bought over 120 acres of land specifically to help young farmers. But what they thought was that the farmers were going to come and make them a profit. And for me, you ain't going to make no profit. You know, really, you got to work hard to make a profit. And so they left. They were bought out. It became a nonprofit. And so now we have 11 different farms from one acre to 50 acres that are farming in the black dirt. We are rooted in food and social justice. We make sure that the farmer that comes to that, uh, that area understand how precious that land is, how precious that soil is, and to make sure that they care for that soil like they, you know, would care for anything else. Great question. So dreams. Another thing, young folks, y'all hear me, right? If you are lucky 
to have grandma, grandpa, abuelo, abuela, tia, tio, and they worked on farms or they grew up on farms, take out your Samsung Galaxy and iPhones and say, tell me our history. Tell me, even from the South, tell me the history. Tell me how you grew food. Where's the medicine from the plants? Tell them, that's your story. Because if you don't capture those stories, I guarantee 10 years from now, they'll say your family never farmed. You don't know nothing about farming. But you got it right here. That's your legacy. That's, so, that's your legacy. Back in the day, we only had pictures. But you got, the, you got social, you got, the, you got in your hands a, a Samsung Galaxy, an iPhone to capture, have them talk about how it was, how they never went to a grocery store, how they was able to wring the chicken neck and get the hogs and all that kind of stuff. But you know what I'm talking about. Understand that's your culture. That's your story. That's your history. And for so long, you be surprised. I love, you know, me, you, the reason why I'm here, let me tell you why I'm here also. Because when, when Dr. Tiffany Young reached out to me, she says, Karen, we can pay you, but we can't pay your airfare and we can't pay your hotel. And for a lot of people, it's like, well, I'm not, you're not going to pay my hotel, you know, I'm not coming. But she talked about this institution, and she talked about this community, and she talked about how you are trying to struggle and make ends meet collectively, how you're starting to learn about your culture, how ethnicity and justice means. And when she started having that conversation with me, I said, I don't care how much it costs me to get here and where I got to sleep, I'm coming. I'm coming because she said how important you all are. And for me to come here because I'm one of you. And that's why I'm here. Because other people would say, huh, you're not paying for everything. <laughs> what? But she had the story about you all and why it's important for me to come here to meet you all and for me to share my story so that one day one of y'all are going to be up here sharing your story and inspiring somebody else to listen to what they have to say. So Dr. Young, thank you so much for inviting me to come because that really, really, <laughs> she, she did it. She did it. And the thing about it, and she said, you know, she said, and I understand if you don't want to come. Some people don't want to come, but she said it. So thank you. <clears throat> okay, next. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so when you were talking, you know who I was thinking of is I was thinking of subsistence farming during the enslavement period. I heard Fannie Lou Hamer come out of your mouth, but now I'm also thinking about this next generation of urban farmers. One in particular, Tanya Denise Fields, I think she's either in the Bronx or she's in- She's in the Boogie Down Bronx! Yes! Black Woman Project! Doing amazing things. And so I'm wondering for folks who don't understand the power of you being here, about the power of subsistence farming, and how even during housing, um, so we had these housing projects, and you know, government people would come in, and we'd have people subsistence farming in urban communities, and how these representatives would pour bleach in the farms, in their urban farms. So to have you here talking about this, I don't know if we understand the richness of connecting subsistence farming, Fannie Lou Hamer and the Mississippi Freedom <laughs> Democratic Party. It, like, it, like I'm geeking out back here. Thank you so much. I challenge everybody before before I ever speak, and I'm so sorry. And I always bring the ancestors into the space because I don't know what I'm going to say. And sometimes the to topics and things I say can be hurtful, but I always come from a place of love, love and truth, because you need to hear it. You need to, it's because no one told. Me, if so, you know, if I was a little girl, I remember. You know, growing up, never thought I'd be a farmer. Never thought I'd be a farmer. And what really made, really sort of, sort of taught my heart, I was at an event one day, and um, I was speaking, and this woman with her six-year-old comes running, Miss Washington, I know you gotta run. And my daughter wants to speak to you. And first of all, can she take a picture with you? And I say, yeah. And then she says, you know what my daughter says? She says, mommy, when I grow up, I wanna be a farmer. I always get choked up because I never thought in my life that a black little six-year-old girl would say to her mother that she wouldn't be a farmer, and her mother was proud. 
Because when I grew up, I could have never said to my parents that I wanted to be a farmer because they would have looked at me like I was crazy. I could never walk around and tell them friends, I'm going to be a farmer. They would have looked at me with such repulsiveness and I would have went away with such shame because I grew up with such shame of being black in America. Of and that understanding that my culture, your culture, this is part of American culture. And what is it about people? What is the fear? What is the fear that people have when we cannot explore our culture? What is it the fear when you're trying to unlock the truth? I did not know. I was taught that we were brought here enslaved because we were dumb and stupid. And it wasn't until I started to unpack the reason why we were brought here was because of our knowledge of agriculture. The colonies could never survive the swampy climate of malaria diseases because we had the trait. They, who did the cooking? Who did the cooking to feed this nation? But yet you look on TV and you don't see us doing culinary work. Who do you think made the drinks? Made, you know, you, you see moonshine, you see barbecue, you don't see our faces, but who was doing the cooking? We were, but yet that's not taught. And what is it about, what is it, what is the fear of not allowing different cultures to understand the true meaning of the American culture, of the American history? I used to sit in farming conferences, farming conference, I used to sit, thousands and thousands of people, and I walk in, I could count on my hand how many people look like me, and I sit in the audience, and I listen to the people on stage talk about agriculture from a white lens, and I sit there and I say, what about me? What has my people contribute? And the same with Latin American, and same with Mexican, we same with all our cultures, we sit in a sea of whiteness, and we have to say, where, where is our contribution to American history? And yet, you now have people that want to deny it. They want to get rid of books. They want to get rid of our history. What is it the fear? What is, what is it the fear of, of the truth of being in America, of being an American, having the history of all cultures that create an opportunity of a food system that is fair and just? And so let's get, let's, let, let's, let's, let's sort of make sure that we can open our minds to different culture because the word agriculture, we have lost culture. We grow food, but we don't talk about culture. And that's what's missing. And until we start talking about culture, there is no agriculture. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Would you talk a little bit about the distribution of what you of the f farm product, and is there a social other social justice aspects to that distribution? Yes. So on our farm, we grow mostly vegetables and herbs. We have two farmers markets, one in Union Square, which is high end, and one in Kingston, which is low end. The food that we grow is intentional to make sure we do everything by hand. We have a walk behind tractor, but that's about it, so that we don't put a lot of heavy, um, heavy equipment um, on the soil. And yeah, it's, it's, you know, we grow food that's culturally appropriate. Um, our farmer's markets, no one walks away hungry. You know, I, I, I just can't understand. I've been to farmer's market, and if they see someone taking something, you know, they, they yell at them. Or, you know, if they can't afford it, they say, you know, put it down and, and get away. I made a pledge, especially having a farmer's market in a low-income neighborhood, that everybody needs to be fed. So if people came to me and said, miss, I'm hungry, my check didn't come in, or I'm sick, I said, here's a bag and, and feed, and feed yourself. I saw a guy one time out of the corner of my eye, and he is inching to try to get a peach. And I looked around, I said, come here. I said, are you hungry? He said, yes. I said, you should never, never feel you have to steal to eat. 
And yet we have people stealing to eat. I said, if you're hungry, come to me. Here is a bag, fill it up. Because no one in this country, no one should be denied food. No one, but yet, food now has become a com commodity. There's a price on it. And I'm not, say and I'm not, saying, I'm not saying as a farmer, because we are for-profit farm, and I have to educate the people in the hood that we got to make money. You know what I'm saying? So again, having that conversation in an area where you're surrounded by food pantries and soup kitchens, they do a phenomenal work. But as a farmer, you got to pay. You, you have to pay because there is a cost and value in food. And yet people in our neighborhood don't know that because they get free food all the time. So I have to educate them and understand that the food here you have to pay. Either your SNAP, your uh, EBT, or your health bucks, but you gotta pay. And the reason why you have to pay, because I'm the farmer, I have to make a living, I come down, pay gas and tolls, and you know what? 90% of them understand it, and they will pay it. Others will say, I'm sorry, I understand it, but I can't afford it, especially those when I'm looking at them and they say, and they say, oh, you gotta pay two dollars, I gotta pay two dollars for carrots, two dollars for beets, and I'm looking at them with their Jordan sneakers on, their nails did, hair done, you know what I'm saying, jewelry, and they ask with with the phone, right? With the phone, <laughs> Galaxy iPhone, and they ask me why I gotta pay for two for two dollars for, for carrots. So but I can have that relationship, you know, I can have that relationship with them and say, you, you gotta pay, because I'm just looking, how much them Jordans on? How much, like $200 of them Jordans? How much was that iPhone? And you're talking about $2 for some carrots or beets? Give me that $2. And then, again, having that relationship, having that relationship with community. And so, good question, is it time now? I'm, okay, I, thank you all, it's been a pleasure. I am done. <laughs> infinite thank yous to Karen. Thank you for bracing us and our community with your presence and energizing us with some really great presentation. And I think that's partially the American experience is one that we have things to look forward to, things to be proud of, and things that we should be uncomfortable with. And so I think we all can leave here tonight with some great homework, some cool things to look forward to, and everybody who is here representing Pima would love to chat with you about what we do at Pima, how we contribute to this work. So, Thank you all for being here. You know, a lot of work goes into these events, but if nobody shows up, it's hard for it to feel like it's important. So every one of you makes these events important and contributes to the culture of this city, of this institution, and we're really proud to share that with people like Karen. So thank you all very much for being here. Please get home safely. Um, again, Dr. Francisca James Hernandez in the green sweater is selling t-shirts if you want to contribute to the scholarship fund. If you scan that QR code, there are two links in the program. One goes to the food arc and the other one goes to our program fund here for EGTS. Lastly, we don't want to waste any food. So there's um, a roll of tin foil out there. So if you have a need for some food, have people at home who are hungry or you just enjoyed it and want to take some more, please don't leave anything on the table. You're not doing anything wrong by making sure it goes to a belly. Um, so thanks everybody. Have a great evening and we'll hopefully see you soon.